again, ladies and gentlemen. This will be a talk on microcytic anemia. It's going to be everything you ever wanted to know about microcytic anemia. Now, as far as step one, I will point you towards the things that you need to know. Um, I'm not going to go into them in super great detail, but if you know all the things in enough detail that I talk about on here, you're going to know enough for your step one. Step two and three, you need to be focused on your management, uh, diagnosis and management, not so much mechanism. So I will talk about that in slightly greater detail because my talks are generally geared towards step two and three. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link below or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. If you consider chipping in a dollar a month, which comes out to about three cents a day, a little bit goes a long way to help offset the cost of these videos. Otherwise, feel free to subscribe to my YouTube page. You'll get alerts as I put new videos up or patronize my advertisers by clicking on the link. All of that is, uh, or by, sorry, by clicking on the ads. All of that is very much appreciated. Okay, so enough of me plugging myself. Let's get on to our material. Microcytic anemia, the causes can be remembered by the mnemonic TAILS, T-A-I-L-S. You can also remember it by the fact that it is either due to a defective globin chain, which is the thalassemias, or a defective heme synthesis. Now remember, your other cause of defective globin chains is going to be what? Sickle cell disease, but that is a normocytic anemia. So thalassemia is your defective globin chain that results in microcytic anemia, very severe microcytic anemia, def uh, severe insofar as it causes a very microcytic cell population, not so much that it causes severe anemia. And then defective heme synthesis, which is anemia of chronic disease, iron deficiency anemia, lead poisoning, and sideroblastic anemia. Lead poisoning is a type of sideroblastic anemia, but I included it here so that you've got your entire tails mnemonic. Now, the most common cause of microcytic anemia is iron deficiency anemia, followed very closely by anemia of chronic disease. These other three are fairly rare in the United States. Your symptoms are going to be anemic symptoms, obviously, fatigue, weakness, malaise, and pallor, in conjunction with a low MCV. Uh, interesting note, a few months ago, I had to take my grandma into the hospital because she was having chest pain. Uh, I thought she was probably having a heart attack or some at least very severe uh, unstable angina. So I took her to the hospital. As it turned out, her cardiac enzymes were high, but she had no blockage. And her cardiac enzymes were high because she was extremely anemic for whatever reason. And the reason behind her chest pain was due to the fact that she wasn't getting uh, oxygen to her heart because she was so anemic. You're anemic, you don't carry oxygen, don't carry oxygen, you're going to result in some degree of, of, of uh, ischemia to your tissues. Okay, so, uh, so that's something to bear in mind, at least for clinical practice. I can't see the USMLE ever testing you on something like that because it's, it's pretty obscure. Overwhelmingly, the number one cause of microcytic anemia is iron deficiency. This is really big here. So if you've got iron deficiency in a younger woman, think menorrhagia. If you have iron deficiency in an older person, think of a cancer of the colon. So very important with iron deficiency anemia to work up for the underlying cause. And that can be done by getting a good history. Ask about melanin in the stools. Check a fecal occult blood test, which can be done in the clinic. If it's a younger woman, ask her about her menstrual periods uh, and, and so forth. The thalassemias are congenital conditions which ma manifest as microcytic anemia. Think of this when you have a very low MCV disproportionate to the degree of anemia. And then sometimes anemia of chronic disease is microcytic, although in many cases it's normocytic. Obviously think of this when you have a patient with chronic disease, as the name implies. Typically, this is going to be autoimmune in the developed world. In the developing world, it's often going to be due to a chronic infection. You can also see this in patients who have malignancy. Sideroblastic anemia can be a congenital condition. It can also be linked to cancer or various toxins, including alcohol, isoniazid, which results in a B6 deficiency, uh, lead, and chloramphenicol. You're not going to see chloramphenicol in the U.S., Think of this when you hear basophilic stippling, and we'll, we'll get to why each of these things cause sideroblastic anemia uh, as we go forward. 
So there are a number of things that you should look for when you've got a microcytic anemia, and they're collectively known as iron studies. And the three components of this that are really important are ferritin, serum-free iron, and TIBC. So we're looking here at the extracellular iron and the intracellular iron. Extracellular iron is iron that is in your peripheral circulation, and that isn't going to include free iron, which is measured as serum iron, and bound iron, which is iron that is bound to transferrin. And we measure this by the TIBC, total iron binding capacity. That's an indirect measure of transferrin. It's roughly proportional. So when you see TIBC or you see transferrin, think of the other thing as well. Transferrin is a carrying protein. It carries iron in the blood. Think of transferrin as transporting iron. And then your intracellular iron is measured by ferritin. And ferritin stores iron in your cells. So it is a measurement of your stored iron. Remember that free iron is toxic to cells. It can catalyze the Fenton reaction, which results in free radicals. So we really want to keep our serum iron as low as we can. Um, so that's why we have the serum ferritin. Uh, and, uh, and that's, again, going to measure the amount of, it's, it's going to be a surrogate marker for the amount of ferritin that's actually inside your cells. Ferritin is also an acute phase reactant, so with inflammation, your ferritin is going to go up. Okay, so as mentioned, ferritin is an acute phase reactant. It, uh, it's going to elevate in the case of inflammation. That's going to be really important when we talk about anemia of chronic disease. So you have inflammation, let's say it's due to an infection, as inflammation was, is originally intended to be for. Uh, that ferritin will sequester iron in your cells. And by doing that, it keeps it away from bacteria and can help starve off the bacteria. Uh, so we see elevated ferritin in cases of inflammation, but remember that not all inflammation is due to an infection. If you have an autoimmune disease, that's going to cause inflammation all of the same, and so your ferritin will go up from that, and in that case, that anemia of chronic disease is not adaptive. And so you'll have anemia of chronic disease, but not due to an infection, and so that's why autoimmune diseases cause uh, a anemia of chronic disease. Uh, it drops in the presence of an iron deficiency, and that's because, well, if you've got low iron, you need to you need to not maximize, but you need to keep an optimal free iron. Uh, and so the ferritin is going to go down if you have an iron deficiency. You need to have that free iron so you can incorporate it into heme. Serum iron, as mentioned, measures the amount of free iron in the serum and then total iron binding capacity. We already talked about that. That's going to elevate in the presence of iron deficiency uh, as an attempt to gather more iron. You're going to increase the amount of transferrin to try to uh, pull in as much iron as you can. It's very important, as mentioned, to investigate for the underlying cause. And then the general principle of treatment is that if a patient has symptomatic anemia or very severe anemia, namely below 7 or 8, then you're going to do fluid resuscitation and red blood cell transfusion. And so you're going to keep your serum hemoglobin over 7 but over 8 for older patients or patients who have known coronary artery disease. Incidentally, my grandma, when she was in the hospital, you know what her hemoglobin was? Five and a half. It was really low. Okay, so this is your lab studies for microcytic anemia. I'm not going to talk about it here because we're going to go into all of this stuff as we uh, tour through all of our microcytic anemias. This is a general uh, sort of diagram of how all of this happens uh, depending on where you are at. So remember that we need to make globin and we need to make heme. So you can have defects in the synthesis of globin. That's going to be your thalassemias. You can also have defects in your synthesis of heme, either due to a deficiency of iron, which is going to mean you can't make heme because you're deficient in the products, or due to a, an issue with the enzymes, either an inherited enzymatic deficiency, an issue with, uh, with the cofactors, namely B6, or inhibition of those enzymes due to typically a heavy metal toxicity. Globin is a component of hemoglobin. It's heme plus globin. Globin, remember, is a tetramer. The typical adult hemoglobin is hemoglobin A, which has two alpha subunits, two beta subunits. Fetuses make a special hemoglobin called 
fetal hemoglobin, very uh, creative name, right? Uh, and that's also known as hemoglobin F, and that is two gamma subunits instead of the beta subunits. Babies will typically start making beta, hemo, uh, beta globin chains at about six months of age. Alpha, beta, and the lesser important delta uh, globin, those are all made at a roughly one-to-one -one ratio, so normally there shouldn't be much alpha, free alpha, beta, or delta subunits around, but that's going to be disordered in the thalassemias, in which case alpha or beta is going to be deficient, so you have an excess of the opposite. Thalassemias in general, they are disorders of globin production, so you'll have a microcytic anemia with fairly normal iron studies because the problem is not in the iron. Unlike iron deficiency, where you're obviously deficient in iron, unlike anemia of chronic disease, where you're sequestering it. Suspicion should be raised when you see a low MCV that's out of proportion to the anemia. Uh, the lab abnormalities will vary, of course, based on the severity. Alpha thal is due to a, a, a disordered production of alpha hemoglobin, and that is due to a deletion of the alpha globin genes. You should know that for step one, that that's due to a deletion. There are four genes that encode alpha production, two on either chromosome. And so you can be missing one, two, three, or all four. Uh, but if you're missing all four alpha uh, subunits that, or alpha genes, then you're going to die in utero. Okay. The severity obviously is going to get worse the more genes you're missing. Beta thalassemia is due to a point mutation at a splice site or promoter sequence for the beta gene. And so there, uh, there are a variety of severities of this, despite the fact that you only have two genes. And so the gene may be fully functional, it may be low function, or it may be non-functional, depending on the point mutation at the either splice site or promoter sequence. If a patient has one normal gene and one arid gene, they're said to have beta thal minor. If they have two arid genes, they're said to have beta thal major, also known as Cooley's anemia. You need to know this regardless of what step you're taking. The definitive diagnosis for thalassemia is not iron studies. It is indeed hemoglobin electrophoresis. And if you're taking step one, you need to know how to read hemoglobin electrophoresis. If you're taking step two or three, you just need to know that's how, that, that is how you do uh, your definitive testing. Ultimately though your most accurate test is genetic testing. So we already talked about alpha thalassemia. If you're taking step one you should know the difference between cis and trans uh, which has to do with the locus of the mutations. Uh, trans is more common in Asian, cis is more common in blacks. Again that's step one stuff. The symptoms will vary depending on the severity or the number of absent alpha genes. You're gonna have anemic symptoms because in thalassemia, you get breakdown, early breakdown of your red blood cells, you can see symptoms associated with destruction of red blood cells. So that's going to be splenomegaly. In addition, you're going to have byproducts of heme degradation, which is going to result in hyperbilirubinemia. And then you can have bony abnormalities due to increased a production of red blood cells because you have a higher turnover. So you can see jaw and frontal bone abnormalities and also fractures. Suspicion, again, this is something I really want you to take from this. Low MCV that's out of proportion to the anemia. I'm talking MCVs lower than 70. The lab anomalies will vary depending on the severity. Diagnosis will be suspected when you see your iron studies as you'll probably get first and you see that really, really low MCV. You'll distinguish this from iron deficiency anemia based on the uh, serum iron and then ultimately the definitive test is hemoglobin electrophoresis. If you're taking step two or three or for clinical practice, something that may be useful for you to know is the Menzer index, M-E-N-T-Z-E-R. And you can look that up if you want, but I am not gonna go into it in detail here. This is the variety of alpha thals that you can have. Be aware of this for step one. If you're taking step two or three, this is probably not super high yield. Okay, so this is just to show you the inheritance pattern.
treatment is going to be just typical for uh, for anemia. So what I want you to know though is that iron supplementation is off the table for any thalassemia. And that's because this is not iron deficiency, right? This is not iron deficiency. This is due to an inability to make globin. Your iron is fine, and that's unlike the other ones we're going to talk about. So the iron is fine, um, but we do transfuse these patients if they're highly symptomatic because that gives them normal red blood cells. Uh, patients who have had repeated transfusions are at risk for iron overload, and so that's something that may get asked of you on the exam. You've got a patient with thal, they've gotten multiple transfusions, and now they've got symptoms of like, cardiomyopathy or liver issues. Uh, in that case, you should think secondary hemochromatosis, and the treatment for that is iron chelation therapy. Deferoxamine is the right answer there. And in the case of hypersplenism, you can do a splenectomy. We talked about the complications from this. They're related to hemochromatosis, breakdown of heme, which causes gallstones, and hypersplenism. Beta thalassemia is pretty much the same as alpha thalassemia insofar as the clinical manifestations. It's really just a difference in the mechanism. This is due to a disorder of beta unit production. Uh, so the treatment is going to be the same and the complications are going to be the same. This you need to be familiar with for step one. And then there's a mnemonic for beta thalassemia. So B for, and it's beta thal D. So that's easy to remember, right? Uh, B for basophilic stippling, but if you see basophilic stippling or you hear about it on the exam, you need to be thinking, of sideroblastic anemia. E for excess iron from transfusion, which you should be able to gather from your history. T for a transplant of bone marrow being curative. A for hemoglobin A being decreased or absent. T for a towering skull and bony abnormalities due to increased uh, production of red blood cells, secondary to the increased turnover. H for heart failure. A for anisocytosis. L for liver and spleen enlargement and D for deferoxamine being your treatment for iron, uh, as an iron chelator in patients who are iron overloaded. Okay, moving on to anemia of chronic disease. We already sort of talked about the mechanism behind that, but the main culprit here is something called hepcidin, and hepcidin is uh, created in response to inflammation. And this is all a very adaptive response to infection. Problem is in the United States, we don't have chronic infection so much as we have chronic inflammation due to autoimmune diseases. So you're typically going to see this in the context of something like rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease or something like that. Inflammation also decreases transferrin production, and so it's going to reduce the total amount of iron that's carried extracellularly, and ultimately that gets incorporated into red blood cells, so you have a problem on that end too. The overall purpose of anemia of chronic disease is to hide iron away from the serum where bacteria can get it. This is going to result in a low hemoglobin because iron is not brought in to make it. You have a reduced, uh, a, a reduced amount of free iron due to the sequestration. You can have, uh, you do have a high ferritin, which is due to, uh, which is, the, the increased ferritin is in order to hold all the intracellular iron that's not bound to hemoglobin, and then, of course, a low serum iron because it's held up in the cells, and a low total iron binding capacity because you reduce your transferrin, uh, and that's going to result in a low TIBC. The diagnosis is by iron studies. Uh, the reticulocytes will be low due to inflammatory mediators. If there are other cytopenias present, then you need to get a bone marrow biopsy. So anemia of chronic disease is solely a, an anemia of your red blood cells. It's not going to result in low white blood cells. It's not going to result in low platelets. If you do have a pancytopenia, you need to be getting your butt on a bone marrow biopsy because that patient probably has a hematologic malignancy or an aplastic anemia, which must be diagnosed. The focus of therapy is going to be tailored towards the underlying cause. Figure out what's causing their chronic inflammation, and you treat that, the anemia of chronic disease will go away. Transfusions are rarely necessary. And then finally, iron deficiency. This is the most common cause of microcytic anemia in the U.S. You can see some unusual symptoms here, namely including pica. These patients walk and chew on ice or they'll crave things like dirt 
or clay or stuff like that where for whatever reason they have a craving for that. Here you'll see anemia, of course, low MCV, of course, low ferritin, and low serum iron because the definition here is that you are iron deficient. Most cases are non-emergent, so your real job here is to investigate the cause. I cannot stress that enough. You've got a patient with iron deficiency anemia, your number one priority is to find the cause. My grandma, when she was in the hospital, you know what they did on her next? They did a colonoscopy. Okay, so again, you're dealing with an older person with iron deficiency anemia, think colon cancer. If you're dealing with a younger woman with iron deficiency anemia, think menorrhagia. Uh, like I said, this is important because in most cases, the cause is more important than the disease itself and the anemia. Uh, low ferritin, because you have no need for it, because you have low iron, low serum iron, because you don't have it, and a high transferrin and TIBC, you increase your transferrin as a uh, futile attempt to increase your iron. And again, you'll see an elevated red blood cell distribution width, and that really separates this from the thalassemias. Causes include excess loss, menorrhagia, occult GI loss. These are probably your most common causes. You can very quickly diagnose an occult GI loss by uh, getting a, 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 a stool sample uh, and then checking that for, for blood. You can get iron deficiency from pregnancy or lactation, but that's a little less common. And then low absorption is a possibility. Look at your history. If the patient has celiac or Crohn's, that's usually established. Okay, so the treatment is generally just oral iron supplementation, uh, but if this is a patient with malabsorption, then instead of oral supplementation, you can give them parenteral iron. Remember that if you're giving a patient oral iron, make sure and stress to them that they're taking something acidic with the iron. So something as simple as orange juice or pineapple juice is fine. That's going to facilitate iron absorption. In a lot of cases, these patients will also need a supplemental fiber because iron supplementation often causes constipation. And then this is important to know, particularly for step one. It's rare, but it's called plumber vincent syndrome. It is a triad of iron deficiency anemia, esophageal webs, and resultant dysphagia. Okay, so look at this. This is a normal blood smear. Notice here you've got a, a you've got a neutrophil and you've got your red blood cells. You should see this area of pallor, but it shouldn't be too big. Now notice this. You see target cells here. You know what target cells are associated with? They are associated with thalassemia. Okay, this is thalassemia. Poikilocytes, target cells, and then some normal cells. Here's more poikilocytes here. Poikilocytes is just another term for teardrop-shaped cells. This is iron deficiency anemia. Basically, what you need to know with this is that the area of central pallor is enlarged. You will see some normal cells and then some very uh, pale looking cells. Okay, finally, sideroblastic anemia. These are disorders of incorporating iron into protoporphyrin in most cases, uh, but in other cases, it is due to either a deficiency of the enzyme, uh, which is usually genetic, or uh, some sort of inhibition of the enzyme. But this is always going to be related to the production of heme. So the result is going to be a low hemoglobin, of course, high ferritin, and that is because you're going to have a backup of iron because you're not producing heme, but you often have iron present. Uh, and so you need to increase your ferritin to, uh, to bind that iron. Uh, and then you'll have a high serum iron, as mentioned, and a normal TIBC because transferrin is not affected by this. The typical findings on the smear is basophilic stippling, and that's your, uh, your iron granules. It can be congenital, but the vast majority of cases are acquired. So this can be due to alcoholism. It can be due to B6 deficiency. Usually that's going to be associated with isoniazid. It can be due to copper deficiency. There's something called Menke's disease, which you should be familiar with for step one, but definitely not step two or three. Heavy metal toxicity, lead is the big one, but copper and zinc 
possibly as well, and then drugs, isoniazid and chloramphenicol and OCDs. But the big one here is isoniazid. That's the one that's most likely to come up on the test. That's associated with ripe therapy for tuberculosis, so look at that in the history. Causes, we already talked about. This is something you need to be familiar with for step one, two, or three. Don't worry about this. Uh, keep in mind here, there are some other things associated with, uh, with the heme production pathway, and those are your porphyrias. Those come up on step one. Your symptoms are going to be anemic symptoms, as well as those associated with the underlying cause. So alcoholism can cause sideroblastic anemia, so look for alcohol in the breath and blood, gait disturbances, hepatomegaly due to hepatic cirrhosis or alcoholic liver disease, and then disturbances on your liver function tests. Just to remind you, if you've got alcoholic liver disease, your AST is going to be elevated greater than your ALT. Heavy metal toxicity, these are going to cause neuropsychiatric symptoms in many cases. A big high yield cause, as mentioned, is lead poisoning. Uh, lead inhibits two different enzymes on the heme synthesis pathway, and the symptoms of lead poisoning can be remembered by the mnemonic LED, L for lead lines uh, that you'll see on x-ray on the metaphyses of long bones, E for encephalopathy, that's your neuropsychiatric symptoms, as well as erythrocyte basophilic stippling, A for abdominal colic, that's always going to come up on your vignette. You've got a, a child with colicky abdominal pain. Uh, and then D for drops, wrist or foot drops, because this can affect the nerves as well. Treatment is obviously lead chelators, and that is dimercaparol, EDTA, and succimer. Succimer is the big one to remember because that's given to children, and usually this shows up in children. The classic history of a child with sideroblastic anemia from lead poisoning is that they live in an older house, in an older neighborhood, and they're gnawing on the walls or on the corners of walls because it's got lead paint, and lead paint is sweet tasting, so kids like to get into that. B6 deficiency, like I said, look for a history of a patient who's taking isoniazid, and also look for other symptoms of B6 deficiency, chelitis, glossitis, and conjunctivitis. Diagnosis is peripheral blood smear. You'll see basophilic stippling and treat the underlying cause. This is basophilic stippling here. These are just iron granules, and you can also see it alternatively on Prussian blue stain. The best first step in therapy is vitamin B6 administration. That will maximize your hemoglobin synthesis, and the uh, response to this will indicate uh, the etiology. If they are, in fact, B6 deficient, which is one of the more common causes, uh, transfusion should only be performed if anemic symptoms are present. The most important thing is to treat the underlying cause. These are chelators. Uh, for your reference, the iron and lead chelators were what we talked about here. All right, my friends, we've reached the end of microcytic anemia, so let's do a quick high-yield recap. So you've got a patient coming in with general anemia symptoms, fatigue, weakness, shortness of breath, not feeling uh, like they normally do, pallor. You're thinking anemia. Get a CBC, check your CBC, hemoglobin low, got anemia, check your MCV then. MCV below 80, microcytic, microcytic anemia. Boom, next step, iron studies. Iron studies are done because iron deficiency is the number one cause in the U.S. Check your iron studies. If they all come back pretty normal looking, you're possibly dealing with thalassemia, check your smear. Smear shows target cells, it's probably thalassemia. You might see some other abnormalities of red blood cells, but target cells is the big one. They may also tell you the patient's ethnic background. Ethnic background, black or Asian, think alpha -thal. If they're Mediterranean, think beta -thal. Definitive diagnosis of thalassemia, hemoglobin electrophoresis. If you're taking step one, got to know how to read electrophoresis because it's a biochemistry question. Step two or three, don't worry about it. Uh, so what you're going to do then for treatment is often, because they have pretty bad anemia, you're going to give them frequent transfusions. Anytime you frequently transfuse someone, run the risk of iron overload. Iron overload is going to result in the formation of free radicals because you have excess free iron, and that can result in tissue damage. You know, right upper quadrant pain because of the liver. You have joint pain. You can have a bronze diabetes. You can have abnormalities of skin pigmentation. Treatment is deferoxamine chelation.
Anemia of chronic disease. The name of the game here is inflammation. Inflammation is what your body thinks is some kind of pathogen, and so the idea is to sequester iron away from that pathogen, but remember that anemia of chronic disease is really just anemia of chronic inflammation. Inflammation is usually in the U.S., chronic inflammation is usually in the U.S. due to autoimmune disease. So think rheumatoid arthritis, celiac, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, HLA-B27, spondyloarthropathies, and so forth. What are you going to see on your panel? Well, you're going to see anything that pulls iron out of your circulation. High ferritin keeps iron sequestered in the cells. Low transferrin re reduces the amount of iron that is circulating around. Remember, this is driven by hepcidin. That could come up on your exam. The treatment here is to manage the underlying cause, reducing inflammation. You can do that with steroids. You can do that with immunosuppressants, disease modulators, and so forth. Okay, that's anemia of chronic disease. Iron deficiency anemia. Obviously, low iron. So your serum iron is going to be low. Your TIBC is going to be high. You increase the amount of transferrin to try to maximize the amount of iron in your circulation to drop off to your developing red blood cells. Ferritin is going to be low because you have low stores. Red blood cell distribution width is going to be wide because some red blood cells are getting hemoglobin, some are not. Uh, you're going to have hypochromic cells because they're just don't have as much hemoglobin as they should. Small cells are possible as well. Big thing with iron deficiency anemia is find the cause. This is so important. Dealing with a younger woman, ask her about her periods. Periods heavy, give her oral contraceptives, iron supplementation. Make sure and take it with orange juice and pineapple or pineapple juice and make sure and give her fiber supplements because oral iron can constipate you. Dealing with an older person, stool goyak. Stool goyak positive, GI bleed. GI bleed could be an ulcer, could be cancer. Do an upper endoscopy, lower endoscopy, treat the cause. Sideroblastic anemia, not common in the U.S., but when it happens, it's usually due to lead poisoning. Lead poisoning, think a child, usually lower socioeconomic status, growing up in an older house where there's lead paint chips. They like to chew on them because they're sweet. Uh, check a lead level, lead level comes back high, chelate them with succimer. Um, if you're dealing with an older person or you know not, not a child, it's probably due to some kind of medication they're on. Isoniazid is a big one, especially if they have a history of tuberculosis. Also could be an alcoholic, although usually alcoholism causes macrocytic anemia. Any of those things could cause sideroblastic anemia. Check the smear, basophilic stippling, you're likely dealing with sideroblastic anemia, but not always. Uh, remember that any of these things, uh, the cause could be, uh, it, it could be any of these things, but if you're dealing with a child, please remember that these levels are not always what I told you. They vary with children, okay? And if you know all this, you know everything you need to know for microcytic anemia. Make sure if you're taking step one, go back and look at your mechanisms because that's really important. All right, and I'll see you next time.